Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for our Village of Alsip committee meeting. Today's November 12, 2019. We'll call this meeting in order at 7.30. Can you call the roll, please? Yes, please. Uh, note for all the people in the audience, please silence your cell phones. If you haven't done so already, thank you. Uh, Trustee Dalzell. Here. Trustee Zielinski. Here. Trustee Juarez. Here. Trustee McLaurin is absent this evening. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Navas Barza. Here. <clears throat> Mayor Ryan. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, just a quick note, I always remind all the students on a night like this that um, we got some students in the audience. Tonight is a committee meeting, so what you're going to hear tonight is just a few topics. I, I, you know, if, if the committees have reports, we're not going to be voting on anything tonight, but you're going to at least hear what kind of business we're, we're talking about tonight then, too. <clears throat> we, uh, we vote at the board meetings. Board meetings are the first and third Mondays every month, obviously in, in respect for uh, Veterans Day yesterday, we had tonight's meeting instead of being a committee night. So there's no voting tonight. Uh, we'll start with officers' reports starting with myself. What I had on the agenda was a discussion regarding, <coughs> excuse me, cannabis taxes and legislation. And really all it is is every committee meeting uh, to the village board, I've been giving everybody uh, information uh, leading up to our public hearing. We're going to have a public hearing here in, uh, on um, November 25th. Do we say 6.30 or 7.30? I believe 6.30. 6.30 um, on Monday, the 25th of November. At that meeting, we're going to discuss, uh, obviously we'll hear from the public if the public wants to voice an opinion on how they feel. Uh, right now, <clears throat> obviously everyone's heard, you know, that the, the state has approved the... Um, sale of recreational cannabis that's going to start in um, January of 2020. I started this conversation a few months ago. I thought the conversation would be a lot easier to have. Uh, certainly when we were kids, we were told it was bad for us. We told our kids it was bad for them. And now, you know, the government said we're going to make it legal. So th I think that's the thing I always want to kind of reiterate all the time, too, is the fact that this is something that... Um, Obviously, like I said, our mindset tells us that this is illegal, but the government's going to say it's okay starting in January. So what I, all I really want to just get across here is a couple of things <clears throat> that we've uh, shared in the last few meetings, but again, just on, on the surface without getting detailed. Now, what if I don't want to, to see this in my community? And the answer would be if a municipality uh, uh, decides to opt out, Certainly, it's going to lose its ability to receive tax proceeds from the cannabis. Uh, right now, how much are how much in taxes will I pay when I buy legal marijuana? And the answer to that would be any marijuana with less than 35% THC is taxed at 10% of the purchase price. Anything above 35% THC is taxed at 25% of the purchase price. And any cannabis-infused products, like, you know, they have gummies and all that kind of thing, will be taxed at 20% of the purchase price. The reason I'm, I'm bringing a lot of this up is um, certainly we all have a moral compass, but at the same time we have to have a business compass, too. And we need to take a good look at this when the time comes. We're going to vote on this um, in our first meeting in December. I think it's December 2nd. And... Um, I really think it's important. Certainly, um, I look at it's it's a it's a fine line we walk when we represent a community, and we certainly we want to look out for what's in the best interest of everybody's safety. And at the same time, we have to look out for what's in the best interest budgetary wise, yeah, too. What's good for our business community? How do we protect our businesses? Um, as well as the, I mean, if everyone goes without saying. I mean, everyone we're looking out for your safety at large, and that that happens 24/7, but. Financially, uh, there are, certainly there's towns that, that have opted out. You know, I actually grabbed a list today uh, that I took offline. Certainly Chicago's in. Uh, in the north suburbs, Arlington Heights is out. Buffalo Grove is in. Crystal Lake will allow it, while Grays Lake will not. Lake Forest will not. 
Lake Zurich will not, and Libertyville won't. But then you've got Mundelein that said they will. Um, Northbrook says they're in. In fact, Northbrook, I found this kind of interesting. They actually um, they approved lowering the minimum location distance from schools and daycares from 500 feet to 250 feet. So they must have some particular neighborhoods in mind that they want to use. That's, that's a young professional community, and um, it was interesting to see that stat. Park Ridge uh, is not going to participate, but Schaumburg is. And um, in the west suburbs, Aurora is participating, while Donner's Grove is not. Lombard is participating. Naperville is not. Oak Park is participating. Riverside's in. And St. Charles is in. Wheaton is out. And then the south suburbs, Bolingbrook is out. And Darien uh, is participating, as well as Joliet. And then uh, Mokina and Orland Park are not, as well as Plainfield. So there's a, there's a good mix there, back and forth, how people feel about this. And again, at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about sales tax here, not property tax. And that's where the, that's where this affects is everyone with sales tax. It helps us pay our bills here. And again, uh, just a couple of you know four points. You know, this is about sales tax. This is also about a substance that. Again, our mind, our mindset has to be trained to understand that this is going to be legal. The General Assembly, uh, in other words, our um, state representatives voted 66 to 47 in favor of this action, and the Senate voted 38 to 17 in favor of this action. Um, again, you know, I, what I had on here with my fact sheets was, <clears throat> where can I, where can I light up a joint? And it says not in public. Uh, there will be no public consumption of cannabis allowed and not in locations where smoking is banned under the Smoke Free Illinois Act. In other words, in areas known as the smoking banned areas. Um, municipalities can allow it uh, with consum if consumption took place at a cannabis related business. And I believe our attorney is reviewing that right now to say that we're not going to allow that. Um, again, that's still up to the board, but that was the recommendation by our police chief. Also, landlords won't be required to allow tenants to possess or consume cannabis on their property as well. So that's where a lot of this work is going to come into place, too, is both landlords and homeowner associations have to identify with this at the same time. And, um, again, there's, there's just a lot of it's a lot of adjustment that, that, the, that our state is going to be going through. And one point that was um, actually uh, Trustee McGlohan, I spoke to her, and she's not here this evening, I talked to her a little while ago, but... That was kind of like her point under her report later on, in Village Properties. The Village of Elsip owns two uh, 55 and older communities known as the Heritage Apartments. And uh, she wanted to just remind everybody that under, uh, because the federal government doesn't recognize cannabis as a legal product, um, not just saying in, in that particular subdivision, but it goes for anybody that's um, receiving any kind of federal funding, whether it, you know, if you're, whether you're getting any type of compensation from the federal government, it prohibits the use of cannabis then too at the same time. And that was kind of her point, was just to get across. And Roger, did you work, did you look at that with her too? It, 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 the, uh, I had a conversation with her last week. Okay, she mentioned your name, and I just want to make sure. So, anyway, um, we're going to have, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a, a public hearing on this on November 25th at 6.30 p.m. here at the Village Hall. So if you'd like to have any input, uh, certainly you're welcome to join us on November 25th then, too. Uh, like I said, I just want to keep this conversation moving. I hate to just show up to a meeting like that and then have everybody go, hey, we haven't had much talk. I want, you know, we've got to push a little further, and I don't see the need. Let's, um, I think we need to um, be de decisive, um, like many decisions that we make on this board. Uh, you gotta, it's, it's hard. You've got to dig in and, um, again, uh, understand... Uh, repercussions both you know like our police chief has said and um, you know simply put you can you can purchase these products in Chicago you can purchase these products in a nearby suburb it's going to be here regardless you know take advantage of the tax implications if that's your choice uh, again the, you know right now they're claiming the other thing I, I had on here too they were saying that in the first year um, on the summary sheet that I gave to everybody.
okay, the first wave of licenses, no less you too. There's 55 right now. There's 55 medical cannabis uh, distribution cent uh, centers in Illinois. They are get, being given the opportunity to get a recreational license now at the same time. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at the same facility. They can set up a second, like where Naperville opted out. <laughs> Naperville's already got a medical marijuana place and stuff. And in this way, they can say, in other words, I'm opting out of, of taking on any more is what they're doing. They've already got a medical one, and the medical guy is getting a second one to open up a recreational one and stuff, too, which he can open up. So they're going to have two places out there regardless. They can say they opted out, but they really didn't um, because they've got it. Uh, what they're going to do in this first wave, they say by May 1st of 2020, um, there's going to be a wave of licenses that go through. They're going to award 75 licenses uh, for new uh, dispensing organizations. Um, by December 21st, 2021, um, again, the agency is going to award up to another 110 licenses uh, for, dis for dispensing purposes. But that is statewide, correct? Right, that's statewide. And um, they're also claiming that revenue-wise, uh, I thought I saw in here that they're going to say... I, I just know, I remember the number, I've read it enough times. They're saying in the first year, they're talking, it can generate as much as 58, here it is. The breakdown, um, Department of Revenue, $34 million, midpoint of range projected by, um, I'm sorry, here it is. Here. The Department of Revenue projects that this industry will generate over $57 million in tax revenue and licensing fees in fiscal year 20, so next year. The year after, they're going to say in fiscal year 21, 2021, this will actually uh, more than double and go up to $140 million in tax revenue. So, again, this is uh, this is why our government went to something like this. It's helping them pay their bills, and obviously they're trying to help the municipalities do the same thing with, this, with the, with the uh, with being, allowing this product to be sold. Um, any questions from anybody right now? Any, anything we need to work on to, before we get to this meeting on the 25th? If you do, just send me an email or something, and I'm, I'm happy to work on it and stuff then, too. But I'm, like I said, I'm trying to keep everybody engaged in this conversation until we get there and stuff then, too. So a lot of work to be done. And, again, our attorney is looking at our ordinance right now. Uh, he's, he wants to clean up a couple of things that we discussed in the past couple of meetings. And that's all I had for the night. Uh, clerk's report. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ryan. First is the presentation of the October 2019 FOIA report. There were 4040 um, requests last month. Um, second in your packet is the presentation of the proposed 2020 Village Board and Committee meeting schedule. Um, we had, uh, I adjusted to Tuesday meetings for um, to observe Martin Luther King Junior Day, President's Day, Memorial Day, Labor Day, and Veterans Day. Um, Columbus Day this year, we did have a meeting. I didn't know if you wanted to adjust next year and move that meeting to a Tuesday as well. That's why it was highlighted in the packet. Is it observed as a federal holiday or anything? Yes, it is. It is. Might as well then, what we did with all the other federal holidays. That was my thought, but I didn't want to... Um, we can, okay. we can vote on that next week. Okay. If anybody has, uh, has an opinion, uh, let us know next week and stuff then, too. Okay. Um, third on my report is discussion uh, regarding the upcoming holiday hours for Village Hall. Traditionally, we are closed on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So this year it's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Um, last year because New Year's Eve had fallen on a Monday and Village Hall hours are traditionally 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday, we did close at 4 p.m. last year on New Year's Eve. However, New Year's Eve this year falls on a Tuesday, so Village Hall will be open 8 to 4 p.m., so I did not know if the board wanted to just leave it as is or change it. We observed 8 to 4 last year, so it would be a normal business day. For that, and then the only other um, timing that may happen is a day for a possible holiday festivity, which I know has not been completely discussed or 
um, decided on yet so that in the past has been some type of Friday when we've closed early but again that is still being worked out but I wanted to talk about more or less um, New Year's Eve and the New Year's Day of course were closed so unless anybody has any other thoughts I figured since New Year's Eve is a Tuesday and business hours are 8 to 4 that'll just maintain 8 to 4 I agree trustees okay okay um, thank you and then last is the presentation of the October 2019 motor fuel tax allotment in the amount of sixty three thousand eight hundred eighty nine dollars forty two cents and that is all Mayor Ryan okay thank you, thank you. Uh, next public forum anybody in the audience wish to address the board tonight nobody all right we'll move on to standing committee reports uh, the first one's the Finance Committee uh, Trustee McLaurin's on our committee. It would be Trustee Dalzell or Trustee Navas Barza. Uh, they'd be presenting a list of the payroll and accounts payable. And then uh, received an invoice from uh, Ansel Glink, a discussion the approval of those invoices for a legislative council. Um, I do have some information to pass out if you'd um, bear with me for a moment. Thank you. And then I'll explain what this is. What I handed out is a copy of a correspondence that I had received from an attorney from Ansel Glink regarding the invoices from 2018. Um, they had been sent to my attention asking for routing for payment, which I left to be done. However, because they are older, it was some additional information that I figured would have been requested by the trustees. So that is what I'd asked for them to provide. And that's what they've given me. I do have um, a total of three invoices for this law from one is um, a current invoice from services that were rendered just here recently within the past month or so so I have that ready for signatures and then I have these two older invoices which is what is referred to in the packet you got a present invoice yes this um, invoice here is for um, what was requested about a month and a half ago. Well, thanks for the information. Um, with regards to this, I mean, we've had this in place for a length of time, and uh, as noted by the information that was passed off by the clerk, uh, this is something that uh, the, the village had approved many years ago. In fact, I was part of it. Um, and now the uh, some trustees had taken uh, use of that, um, and they're lawful invoices, so I, I think that they should be paid. My only concern here is that we're paying invoices simply on an invoice. There's no work product here whatsoever. So my personal feeling is, is that the village is expending monies for this, and if there was information learned, I think it should be shared with the entire board so that we're aware of we're either doing things properly, we could do things better, we should change our methodology or procedures in order that we I just don't want to see this thing come up time and time again to where we're making use of a, a law firm and, uh, and and getting services done but you know, I mean to me there's a transparency issue here so these things I, I'm just saying my comments. I, I understand I I'm, I'm just the bearer of information <laughs> right right so uh, to expend the monies and, and it's not inexpensive it's two hundred dollars an hour so we've got invoices now totaling eighteen hundred dollars and again 
I think they're legal invoices, and we have no reason not to, to sit there and pay them. I, I wish I knew where this invoice was from 2018. And right. No, no, no. I, I, I understand, and that's why when they were sent to me, I was like, well, I figured that the board would want more information, so that's why there was a slight back and forth between yep. the law firm and myself, and that's what we're sharing. I'll add to that, um, I'm a newer member on this board, so my under just uh, I'd appreciate it, just a, a better understanding of legislative council. Um, since I, I would assume that if I had questions, I would ask the village attorney if um, if I had any questions, and if I felt that they didn't give me um, good, I guess legal advice. I guess that would be the first step, right? And then move forward um, and, and pursue legislative counsel. So I'm not sure if, uh, what's the process involved um, with that, if, if anyone can kind of chime in. If well, first off, um, just uh, for the benefit of the audience too, legislative counsel is a secondary uh, set of a, a law firm where the village uh, uh, trustees can defer to a secondary counsel should they not, um, let's just say if they didn't benefit from speaking with our current village attorney who's been appointed by the board with the advice and uh, appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the board. So we do have a village attorney and uh, back in 2014 we did pass an ordinance that did allow for um, legislative counsel uh, in the event we felt that we wanted a second opinion uh, on matters and so forth then too. But, you know, I think what I, I'm just going to generalize what Trustee Dalzell was just saying too is that um, two years ago uh, there was it was a different board and you had four trustees that approved the use of legislative counsel well, two of those four trustees aren't here any longer. And I, and I think what concerns me about this is that I don't believe two trustees would have standing to run up a, like bills uh, for the rest unless you have unless you have board approval because you still need four votes to approve all expenditures. So what I think what I'd be looking for is when you say uh, a work product, what was discussed at these meetings so we know what we're paying for? Like what what... what as I see on this latest one here, review FOIA request. Did 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 because it's got Trustee Zelensky and Juarez on her. Did you guys submit FOIAs? That was in response to FOIAs that were received by the village that I needed to request any type of correspondence that members of the board or any other village employees had received or had sent to um, particular parties. So why would we farm that out to another attorney? We, we, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't farm out the FOIA request. It, what I believe the request for legislative counsel had to do with what to respond. That. So did they physically uh, get FOIAs sent to them? I sent them copies of the FOIAs that the village had requested with my request for information from all the trustees. So I have a question to that then, since it's legislative council, so the trustees are legislative members, right? And I mean, are, is the clerk's office considered a legislative body? And so that's what I had questions about with um, the information here. It's this telephone conference with Clerk Petzl regarding FOIA requests. So is that something that sh should have been approved, or is that okay? Or that's my I question. I was answering a phone call uh, that I received from the attorney's office with respect to the request of Trustee Zelinsky and Trustee The clerk's Warren. office takes care of the FOIAs in turn. Clerk Petzl was the one who had to answer that. And we're being billed for that. So what I'm asking though is Clerk uh, Petzl, did, did we turn over information to this attorney to review a FOIA? I turned over yes. the FOIA request. I did not turn over any information that I That's had what received. I'm right. No. Okay. I turned over the FOIA, the 
cover memo that I send with the FOIAs as well as the FOIA itself. Okay, yeah, because they, they've got, the way they wrote this is review FOIA request. I get it. So they're just looking at the request. Correct. Not the actual information. They're not yeah, reviewing they, I, FOIAs. I did not share right. any information that I was given in response from anybody right. for that. Because that's certainly not a legislative action is what I'm getting at. And stuff no. Then too. Okay. Do we have to dig into why we requested them? I would think, well, I would think that um, even for the use of legislative counsel, if if the taxpayers, you know, if the village is paying for um, services, I think that's what Trustee Dalzell was just saying: is you're looking for a work product. You're we're looking for it's like a report. I understand you want an itemized type bill from. Canceled link. We got well, it. We got an IOI yeah. bill. So what exactly are you asking for? A work product. So something was discussed, and there was a question proposed and an answer given. We need are to we to do this over and over again? The next board that comes in has nothing to refer to anything, and so we're going to go ahead and keep on incurring legal fees because we don't have a record of anything that was presented, discussed, or returned so that anyone can sit there and make reference to it should this thing happen again. A work product, that's all. So should what happen again? A request Anybody? of legislative counsel. Oh, okay. I mean, we can go over why legislative counsel was requested if that's what we want. I was just asking for a work product, that's all. I have no problem with the, the bill. I have no problem with legislative counsel. I think that everything's fine and proper, other than the fact that we didn't pay it since 2018. Yeah, I don't know why those bills weren't paid or why they're brought up now. Right. I don't know either, but the point Where is... Where have they been? I, I have no idea. It was brought to my attention when the attorney called to ask the question. I understand. I'm asking and the I, mayor, do you I know why these, where these know. bills have been sitting for a year? I've been here since... May of 2017, I have never once seen these bills. And, and the finance director hasn't either. They've never called. They've never done anything. And all of a sudden, these bills for $1,200 show up saying that they did work. Uh, in fact, she even mentions in here in her, in her, her uh, report that the clerk just gave us, I do not recall. It says that, unfortunately, I do not have the names of the trustees who I met with. And after almost two years, I do not recall their names. I do have text messages from former uh, trustee Sheila McGreal uh, about the meetings and um, she had some questions. Uh, the work I performed for ELSA of trustees was on legislative issues uh, within the scope of services for legislative council. Um, I sincerely hope the village is not implying that, you know, the delinquent invoices um, won't be paid. Well, we're not implying that at all, but we'd like to, you know, this is this is actually two fiscal years old and we're getting invoices from. Like I said, somebody else, like even so you're the saying trustee. these bills were just submitted. Yeah, I, okay. I've never seen them. Nobody's ever called me. That's what I was asking. Yeah, where, nobody's where ever called on payment. payment. Okay. could look into that previous bill, but this one is probably just retaining fees. It's what? Retaining fees. Retaining fees. Like a retainer? I'd no, not at all. It says right here. Correspondence from yourself and yes. Trustee Juarez, and email correspondence between yourself and Trustee Juarez. There's no re retainer here at all. Oh, okay, so you want, you want what was actually corresponded? I mean, you want the emails or what? Help me out. What am I, I I think what's proper would be whatever the question is and whatever the end result or recommendation of the attorney is. So that should a similar scenario play itself out, that we're not going to go incur a $600 fee again when we already have an answer provided based upon this work performed. But right now, we're asked to sit there and pay a bill that... I think right now it's only you and Trustee Juarez who are aware of what was presented and discussed. None of the rest of us. 
but yet the village is going to go out and expend now this dollar amount, and for what? For what service? No one's aware. I mean, this is not open and transparent. Um, I believe this is the same format uh, as invoices that we do receive from the village attorney as well, correct? Right. Um, and I can say I'm 98% of, uh, I have knowledge of what they're working on all the time because I have to review their bill when I get it. And right. Stuff too. Right. But, but also the, 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 the village attorney gives us the work product of what that is. So if they're working on a tip, tip or an or ordinance right. or whatever, sure. we get something in hand right. for what that is. If you know they're so working on uh, the, the tax negotiating issues. contracts <coughs> or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning of her letter, she states that she does not remember who she spoke with. However, she does have her notes. Can you just request her notes? <coughs> That'd be fine, too. Sure, that's from the 2018. That's from the January and February of 2018. September of 2017. I'm not saying that anything was wrong here. I'm just saying is, is that we should have the benefit for what we're paying for. That's all. Especially if it's with public monies. Right. Well, the questions were about appointments and, and other legislative issues. So if she says here she has her notes, then we could just request her notes. That's, yeah. Does anybody that's, remember being in that meeting with? I do. Trustee yes. Mitz. So the the three. There was four uh, of us. There was, yeah, there was four of us. Four. Okay. And was anything changed from because of it? No. Yeah. So everything was proper and yes. Okay. So. This one is for something different. Yeah, I still think that the work product is important. So, trustee. Anyway, going back to what you just said, trustee Zelensky, you said that you thought this was a retainer. But I she's got on here. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't really. He read does. It. This well, is uh, Dave just, Warner. Just assuming. Yeah, that he met twice. It looks like uh, October 18th and October 23rd uh, to do work, and um, just emails and stuff like that. But he's got three hours into this, and um, at a cost of $600. And um, as Trustee Dalzal just said. That's what we're looking for is, is a report on that to see exactly what, what was being done. I can uh, request that information for you. Then I would just make sure that we sign these bills and get them processed so that, for, so that they're paid. Trustee Dalzell, would you like the other two that are stamped at least to keep them all together? Um, these are stamped. I already signed off on them. Okay. I wasn't sure if you had copies stamped as well. So it's just the two of them, right? There's a There's total of three There's actually two invoices. included in here than the third there. But just one signature. Eight. Yeah. Other included bulger. Twelve hundred dollars. Trustee, when you get a hold of those notes, can you also ask her if she submitted? If this is the first time she submitted to get paid, or did she submit it before? Sure. I'm curious to know. I mean, you would think if somebody hasn't been paid in almost right. 20 months, they would have called. Yeah. At least I had another notice. And certainly, you know, um, like I said, finance said they haven't gotten a call. My office hasn't gotten a call on this either. Professional services at $200 an hour. Um, any other questions on this? No. Nope. That's live, Mayor. All right. Next is the fire committee, uh, Trustee Murphy. No report tonight, sir. All right. Uh, police, police and traffic safety, Trustee Delzell. Uh, I have the pleasure of reading two letters. Uh, first is a letter 
to the also police department uh, we wanted to say thank you to the also police department for their extra support during the time frame of october 19th 2019 through november 3rd of 2019 especially like to thank sergeant chad resney officer jim tishko and deputy chief schult who we believe went above and beyond our expectations during this mentioned time frame while we're away from home we viewed on our ring video that someone had hopped our fence coming into our yard during the night and was checking doors garage doors shed door car doors, then noticed the second camera and left the yard via hopping the back fence. While in another state, we called the Elsa Police Department explaining the situation. They were prompt to arrive to our home, making certain that all was secure. Uh, we were asked to also forward the ring video to the Elsa Police Department, which we did. From this point, they put the house on a house watch for the time, uh, which would be gone, and true to their words, an officer came by every shift to check our property, being sure all doors are secure. Thank you for all your hard work and dedication. And secondly, dated November 8th, 2019, to Officer Jason Sawicki uh, from Police Chief Jay Miller, letter of recognition. On 15 October 2019, at approximately 2200 hours, also police officers are dispatched to a person shot at the Wendy's 111, 111th 10 South Cicero. Upon arrival, the officers encountered a female employee who had suffered a gunshot wound to her leg. The officers on scene rendered aid to the victim while establishing and coordinating off a crime scene. Officers began the initial investigation while awaiting the arrival from investigators. Officers quick concluded that the shot was fired came from inside of the restaurant by an employee. Employees were detained pending in an in-depth interview. Officer Slowicki, who was a reporting officer as well as the evidence technician, took point in the investigation. Officer Slowicki conducted a brief interview of the employees while also reviewing the surveillance video of the location. After realizing some discrepancies in the employee's statements and what the video had showed, Officer Swicky observed a suspicious movement by the restaurant's manager and retraced his steps. Officer Swicky was able to locate the firearm used in this incident under a storage shelf. The recovery of the firearm was key to the offender's ultimate confession in the incident. Without the hard work and investigative skills, this incident may have been delayed in prosecution. Your actions during this incident are worthy of special mention and recognition. Your attention to the details within the incident speaks highly your dedication to aggressively detect criminal activity and arrest criminal offenders. It also proudly shows your deep commitment to helping this agency accomplish its mission and goals. Please accept my personal congratulations on a job well done. Respectfully, Jay Miller, Chief of Police. And that's all I have, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, next public work and boat launch, uh, Trustee Juarez. I have a presentation of the October 2019 Public Works Department monthly activity report. It's all mayor. All right, and um, Superintendent Freider had some place to be uh, excused in this evening. Uh, Su Sewer and Water, uh, Trustee Navas Farza. Presentation of the October 2019 Water and Sewer Department monthly activity report. And I have an update from Water Commissioner Triven about two pending projects. Yes, thank you. So um, I did want to update you on the Pulaski uh, water main project um, under the TIF. That uh, water main is installed and completed. By the end of the week, it'll be in service for um, the customers there on the east side of Pulaski. Um, so basically, all we have left there is restoration work. Um, the second one is we did get a proposal for the um, Pulaski to Springfield Avenue water main looping that we were looking to do. Um, and from Robinson for the design engineering of the project and also working on the easements, um, gaining those easement rights. And their proposal <coughs> um, covers all that work and is a, a total of $104,000 is what, what the proposal is for the design engineering work, the uh, easement grants, and the um, bid documents so we're just looking to see if we can get this on the agenda for next week to push this project the 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 thing that we don't have is this is not a project that we had proposed for this fiscal year budget it's not in the budget we've discussed it previously in the fact that we did need some you know looping to eliminate those dead ends but we're looking to prioritize this project now due to the fact that we have some property development that's going on there that is going to need the, these improvements to gain the necessary fire protection that they need for that property. 
Dan, I've, I've, I've spoke to this a couple of times to let, to let everybody know. And um, obviously, we're, we're still having that issue where what Danny's trying to accomplish is a, a truck took took on a um, hit a fire hydrant near Restaurant Depot at 127th and Pulaski. It kind of jarred that line. We get sporadic uh, water main breaks now northbound on Pulaski near AT&T. And at the same time, we have a brand new business being built a block east of there. And we need to improve that line. And because we can't get access through the middle of AT&T's property, we got to take this all the way up to the tracks northbound and come all the way around uh, to do this loop. So this is where all that comes into play. And we still haven't actually resolved the easement rights over near some private business either, right? Right. We, you know, AT&T is on board. Um, we're still working with RK Press to, you know, see where they're going to land. But again, even with, you know, as part of the discussions with Robinson, they would work to coordinate that negotiations with that property owner right um, but it the the you know total project it would be the replacement of 1300 feet of six inch water main on Pulaski and the addition of another 900 feet of main to connect Pulaski to Springfield Avenue do we have a uh, estimate as to what all that would run that's what the engineering part of the they're going to figure that out exactly they give okay. a cost estimate as well and there's no negotiating with the business owners. We're, we're in, you know, preliminary discussions with the one, you know, business owner. He's, you know, discussing it with his attorney. He's just not familiar with the process. Wanted to, you know, review it with his attorney before he, you know, committed to anything. Okay. I don't know that we have much of a choice. We got to get this done. You know, so we but. we do have to do something with respect to, you know, those two areas, Hamlin and Springfield, with those dead ends. Are notorious for low fire protection flow and you know as properties get developed and you know more and more you know property needs to be protected we need to improve the fire protection yes know, flow available okay so trustee you have to get down the agenda for next week all right mm -hmm. okay anything else Dan no I think that's it thank you anything else trustee no that's it okay. there um, this, uh, building and Health, uh, Trustee Zelensky. I have a presentation of the October 2019 Building Department Monthly Activity Report and also a presentation of the October 2019 Health Department Monthly Activity Report. That's all I have tonight. All right. Thank you. Uh, Human Resource and Insurance, Trustee Murphy. No report, Mayor. All right. Special Committee Reports, Economic Development, Trustee Nava Esparza. Um, I have on the agenda a discussion to create an economic development intern position. Um, I had mentioned this in our last uh, board meeting, and in the board packet, I provided um, documents from the UIC uh, Master's Urban and Planning and Policy um, Program. Um, it's an example um, of an, uh, an existing graduate program that has internship placements at various organizations and municipalities. Um, across the Chicagoland area, a, a pipeline that we could potentially tap into if we decide to move forward and create the economic development intern position. And yes, it's um, my alma mater. Um, so I'd included the um, the just FAQs that they um, Amber Forte, um, the coordinator there, uh, provided me about the program um, and also the internship fair. Um, where they allow municipalities and also other organizations to come and interview potential candidates. So these students, um, they're required to complete a 300-hour internship program. Um, they're graduate-level students that have some prior work experience. So we don't specifically have to partner with this um, organization, but again, it's an option. And just to kind of give um, a little bit of information to the board about um, urban planning, um, maybe the role or the skill set some of these students might have or someone with a background in urban planning or public administration. And the reason why I wanted to advocate for the economic development internship position is that, again, ha as I mentioned in the previous board meeting, was that there is no staff person that's specifically dedicated. And some municipalities have, you know, jumped forward and created a full-time staff position. But I want to take a, a, I guess, a more strategic approach and start off with an internship program and see what are maybe key roles that the individual should be responsible for before we, we would consider perhaps creating a full-time, if that, that makes sense. If not, internships um, also provide valuable experience on the job training and also for the uh, municipalities such as ourselves uh, tap into um, talent um, 
I guess, those that are um, aware of trends and other technology uses and so forth. So that's why I wanted to present to the board uh, for consideration creating a position. Um, and then I would, if, if there's somewhat of a consensus, then move forward and cre kind of create um, an internship description. Um, and then, you know, the wage and so forth like that, all that comes, that comes with it. And if anyone had any questions. So at this time, we're not, like you say, an internship is exactly what it is. There's no cost involved in something like that on the front end? Um, some internships are unpaid, and some of these students will take an unpaid internship if it's um, something that really interests them. Um, but most internships um, are paid. Um, but then there are other universities that offer what they call service learning, where they will pay for the student to be there as well. So if that's something that uh, we'd want to consider as an option, as an unpaid internship or paid, um, and I'm not sure what, what we could budget for it, um, the date for this internship connection, for example, at UIC is in March, and they'll start reaching out to organizations in December and January for those that are interested. And the idea that I had in mind with this position, because there's still time to discuss this further, is a summer internship um, where the student might be able to um, commit more hours, maybe about 10, 15 hours per week, um, and during the academic year as well, 10 to 15. But I know um, I can bring us an example of an internship uh, program in Lincolnwood, Illinois. Um, and I know I completed an internship in the village of Lake Zurich so I can reach out to them as well if they have um, samples of um, descriptions. But the idea that I had with the internship uh, experience would be to maybe do business surveys, update content for the economic development page for the village, um, and uh, other research that they can do that might be of value for myself um, and others that we're trying to advocate for the village and provide information as well. Certainly, I think, you know, unpaid is always a wonderful thing, but I understand, you know, there's always a economics involved all the time. I, obviously, we don't have anything appropriated for right now in this year's budget. Um, our finance director, he's on vacation for the rest of this week, so when he gets back next week, uh, I'd ask if you can follow up with him and see if there's any any contingency money, anything like that, that the board can, can consider. And if you've got anything in the meantime to say what this potential cost could be, obviously that's you're, the finance director is going to ask you the same thing. But th I'd come back to the board, maybe even next committee, and see what we can do with that then, too. Okay. okay. What's a typical wage for something like that? Minimum or? Um, roughly 15 um, okay. an hour. Um, I think it's also um, factoring the commute costs, perhaps someone coming from, like, the downtown area, commuting here, um, and then also just trying to recruit talent. In Lake Zurich, when I was an intern, it was 15. Um, so they're in Lake County, Illinois. And other internships were unpaid. Um, so students might be, you know, if they had the financial means to take an unpaid internship, they would. Um, maybe it's close to home and so forth like that. But to kind of get the experience, if someone's interested in municipal planning, they might want to, you know, take on an unpaid internship at a municipal government as well. So it depends on the, the, the student and also the, the university that provides financial support for them as well. Middle Oathian actually did that a couple of years ago. They actually had a group of um, students, an economic development group that um, they took on to do um, planning from the University of Illinois. And um, it's it's not an easy concept to do because there's, you got some, you have, certainly have some management that you have to coordinate. And certainly a, a single individual is much easier to work with than a group is then too. So um, I don't know if it was. I, I can't speak to the success That's if it was or not. I have to get a. Re I, I know the uh, mayor over in Middle Oath. I could certainly get a report from him and find out. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll bring that in with your discussion to the next committee, and we can talk about it. Is this for Plasky or is this global? I, I'm I'm thinking village wide. Right? Is that what you're thinking? Yes, village wide. Yeah. Okay. If if it's Pulaski, then that can also be an option because sometimes. Um, Students will do things that are project-based, so they might, they would have to produce a report. Right. Um, so that could be something that would be beneficial as well. Plasky, TIF, the bunnies would be easier because it is an appropriation there, right? right. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you, Trustee. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we've got the um, Village Properties Committee. Uh, it would be Trustee Juarez or Trustee Navas, Barza, please. Um, uh, go ahead. You want to go ahead? 
Uh, what was it? Village properties? Correct. Uh, item one, discussion regarding smoking of cannabis at the heritage complexes and authorization for the village attorney to develop language for incorporation into standard lease agreements. Potential language to be along the lines of the tenant shall not and shall not permit anyone to smoke or cultivate cannabis or any other federally prohibited substance in any part of the premises, the common areas, or the property of which they form a part. Excuse me. So, Trustee McGlawhorn, excuse me, she's not here this evening. I did have a short conversation with her on this. All the new leases, this is a 55 and older community, as I said before. All the new leases start like January 1st. Uh, I believe we did say, Roger, we can just offer a rider that goes with those leases uh, without having to redraft um, lease agreements, correct? That is correct. Okay. What we were looking to do is add that language as a rider to prohibit any of the seniors from smoking marijuana. They they would be able to ingest, but they would not be able to smoke it in the in the buildings. Is what we were looking at. Would they be able to smoke it on the campus at all? No. Okay. What if it's prescribed to them? That's up up to you guys to decide. But at this point, we were looking at prohibiting it completely. We do have smoke-free buildings. And we would like to keep them that way. But if it's pre and prescribed to them, how can we keep it from them? Well, they would be able to ingest it. Prescription, you is prescription, you could get. Scope. Yeah. But they would not be able to smoke it. They would have to do it in just another way. Another. Correct. Like gummies or whatever. Like the brownies or whatever. <laughs> so I'll ask. Uh, I'll ask trustee. Well, let's put it this way. Any. Was there any more questions on that first? It was my understanding that a informal poll was taken of, of the residents, and most of the residents had said that they were against the smoking of cannabis in that area. Right. That is correct. So, yeah, there's there's other means other than smoking it in the complexes. They can ingest it. They can brownies, gummies, whatever they want. Yeah, to that's what's going to ask that ingest. Ingesting is like a food source. Food right? source. So, okay. Got any recipes for that, Chris? <laughs> I could come up with a few. <laughs> he's, to, he's an executive chef. Don't get the wrong idea. To, <laughs> all right, that's what he does for a living. Combine mocklet yeah, with you it. Yeah, throw a little yeah. humor. This meeting's too strong here. So we're almost done. <laughs> um, anything else, you, uh, everyone? No. Okay. Uh, ordinance legislation. Trustee Zelensky. I the book. Uh, no report this evening, Mayor. Okay. Uh, it. Trustee Dalzell. No report, Mayor. Okay. Planning and zoning and licenses, Trustee Juarez. I have a presentation of a list of licenses dated October 28th through November 11th, 2019. That's all, Mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, trustees, any presentations, petitions, or communications? Nope. Any unfinished business? Any new business? Can I get a motion to adjourn then? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. We'll adjourn this meeting at 8.25. Uh, students, if for any reason you want to go back and look at this again, uh, this is YouTube. There's a camera facing on us, not you. It's up in the ceiling. And um, you can always go back to a YouTube and just put in Village of Elsa meetings and tonight's date and watch it again if you think it's necessary. But, um, again, thank you for coming out. And join us anytime you want on a Monday night then, too. Anyone that needs anything signed, please bring it up.